We have with us today uh, Susie, and uh, Susie, you don't have a lot of experience in muscle response testing at all, do you? No, none. Has anybody ever even done a muscle response test with you? No, not that I can remember. Perfect. So the reason I say perfect is because in the, in the world of muscle response testing, there's a lot of confusion. And uh, one of the things that I always ask people to do as I begin teaching muscle response testing is, uh, uh, first of all, to bring to mind everything that you've ever learned or seen or known about muscle response testing, and then wipe that slate clean. <laughs> Just get rid of that for the moment and forget about anything you may have learned. And the reason that I say that is that there's really a lot of misinformation, disinformation, a lot of confusion about muscle response testing. And uh, we want to apply a uh, kind of a, a standard of evaluating what's real and what's true that was uh, put forward back in the 14th century, I think it was, by a Franciscan friar named Occam. And uh, it's called Occam's Razor. And basically what Occam said is if you want to understand something, if you want to understand the truth of something, just take an explanation and start carving away any part of it that's not necessary to understand uh, what you're trying to explain. And what's left when you can't carve away anything more is probably what's true. And so that's what we're going to do with muscle response testing. We're going to try to take this down to the, to the bare essentials so that we can understand it as clearly uh, as possible. So uh, if you've read the different books about muscle response testing, uh, I'll ask that you just forget what you've learned. One that I pick on occasionally is uh, by uh, David Hawkins, an MD, a PhD, and really a brilliant guy, and I, I like a lot of his books. But in one of his books, Power Versus Force, Dr. Hawkins explains that the reason that uh, when you do a muscle response test that uh, the body gives a weak response to an answer that's false is that the human mind can't tolerate an untruth. And uh, I think most of us is, have been around the, the block uh, enough times to know that actually the human mind <laughs> tolerates a lot of untruths fairly well. So when we look at muscle response testing, I'm going to demonstrate to you why that particular idea is just false, demonstrably false. And uh, what we're going to try to do is understand muscle response testing in a really uh, bulletproof way so that you can use it uh, to get reliable responses to help you make decisions in terms of your own health care and lifestyle. As we begin, we should have a little conversation because here's the idea of muscle response testing. What we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to have a conversation, not the kind of conversation that we're having now, uh, that we have all the time with people, a verbal conversation, a conscious mind conversation, but instead I'm going to show you how to have a conversation directly with the body. And in that conversation, what's going to happen is that we're going to bring to mind particular questions. We're not going to verbalize them. And the body's going to understand those questions, and it's going to be able to deliver an answer to us in terms of a change in a muscle response, a change from, say, a strong response to kind of a weak, mushy response. And when you think about that, the idea that we could just bring to mind questions and somehow your body will know the question and be able to respond to it, it's kind of a crazy idea, right? Yeah, a bit, a little bit. And so we have to talk about what is it about the, the nature of the world and the way that we are that allow that to be true. So most of us, I think you'd agree, see the world in this way. We see ourselves here looking out at a world that's preformed outside of ourselves and it's populated by all these different things all these different people. I mean, each of those things and each of those people are separate and distinct from one another, separated by time, separated by space, and we look out and we view them separate from ourselves. When we look at any particular thing, we realize that it's made of smaller things. Anything that we could imagine, we can take apart, right? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we can... Uh, 
we can look at any particular physical object and we know that what if we take a fine enough microscope and we look at it there's molecules that make it up and if we can see past those molecules we'd see that there were atoms that made up those molecules and if we could even look closer than that we'd see that each of those atoms is made up of little particles like electrons and protons and neutrons and things like that. But there's an interesting thing that happened about 100 years ago in the world of physics, and this is what's called quantum mechanics. And when quantum mechanics got to the point in looking at the nature of the universe and looking at the really teeniest, tiniest divisions of the universe, what they found is that when we get down to that level, of electrons and these elementary particles and then we try to look beyond that to see what they are made of that in fact this old idea that we had that big things were made out of little things all of a sudden it kind of falls apart and in the world of quantum mechanics when we get down to these really fine 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 divisions of things what it tells us is that what those things are made of is waves of information and waves that are different than the way we think of like waves in water or waves in, in the air, sound waves in the air. Because when we talk about those kind of waves, we're talking about waves that exist in some physical stuff, right? But what quantum mechanics tells us is that when we get down to these tiny, tiny levels of reality, what we're really talking about is informational waves. And informational waves that exist in what? In a field of consciousness. So it gives us really a different way of looking at things. And that's the way that you and I are going to look at one another as we do this muscle response testing. And here's what I mean by that. Is instead of seeing the world the way it appears to us on the surface, which is undeniably true, we're going to realize that underneath that level of reality is a different and more subtle level of reality. And at that level, the physicalness of things, if there is such a word as physicalness, disappears. And everything that exists, including ourselves, are really fields of information, living, breathing, transforming and changing fields of information in a larger, undivided field of information. And when we see things that way, the reason it's important is that it opens up new possibilities. Because when I originally said that what we're going to do as we do this muscle testing is have this conversation in which I bring to mind particular thoughts and then test your body for a response, in the context of the way we might have previously looked at the way we are and the way the world is that we live in, we would have said, you know, that's kind of a crazy idea. But when we look at the world from this quantum mechanical point of view and we see everything existing as informational fields that resonate and communicate with one another, we realize that all of a sudden there's another possibility and that we can interact in a different way that would have seemed impossible from a different point of view. So Susie, <clears throat> taking this point of view that we've talked about just now, we're looking at each other in a little different way. We're looking at each other as a field of consciousness and that as soon as we begin to choose to interact together around some area of interest, that our fields of consciousness begin resonating, interacting, exchanging information automatically. So we want to recognize as we sit down with anybody to do muscle response testing that as a result of our intention and their intention to come together to do this kind of interaction, that before we even open our mouths to say a word, there's already information that we're exchanging with one another. Muscle response testing should be seen in this way, that if in fact there's this kind of resonance, this informational resonance between us revolving around our intended area of interaction in the muscle test, then what we'd like to do is bring that to a conscious level. This resonance that I'm talking about happens at an unconscious level. And the way we're going to look at muscle response testing is 
The term I use is, is an external indicator, and I'll show you what I mean in just a minute, but it's an external indicator that will bring to an observable conscious level of observation something that our body already knows at an unconscious level. Okay, so let's take a look at this. As we begin to do muscle response testing, uh, first of all, we want to think again about this idea that there is a kind of other than conscious or subconscious communication that's, that exists between Susie and I simply because we've come together with the intention of interacting, of collaborating, of communicating uh, in a way that will be helpful to her. So our purpose in muscle response testing is to use some particular test muscle as a window to show us on a conscious level, a level that we can observe, uh, what is already known at an unconscious level. Now, in selecting a particular muscle to use, the only thing that's really important is that the muscle be something that's convenient for us to use. And uh, we'll begin with uh, using a muscle in the shoulder called the deltoid muscle, which is here in the front of the shoulder and elevates the arm in this way. So, Susie, let me have you just hold your arm straight like this. And the instruction that I'll give you is this. I want you to resist with a consistent level of effort. So you can imagine what a two pound chicken feels like, right? Mm -hmm. Most of us can. And what I want you to do is use the effort it would take you to hold up a two pound chicken. And <clears throat> the thing that I'll explain about muscle response testing is that when you have the intention to hold your arm up with that level of effort, you create some signals in what's called the motor cortex of your brain, and you send those to the muscle in your shoulder, and it creates a resistance, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's certain circuits that exist in your nervous system called inhibitory circuits. And if your body, if your brain turns on an inhibitory circuit, it can actually negate those signals that you're intending to send to the muscles. So that creates an opportunity for us to be able to observe a strong or a weak test automatically in, in response to questions that I'll ask you. So again, I'll ask you to hold with a consistent effort that uh, it would take to hold up a two pound chicken. And there it is. And what I feel is a nice crisp response. The resistance in the muscle is just right there. Yeah. So now I'm going to go through part of a training exercise that we'll learn step by step in a minute. But what I'm going to do is ask Susie's body certain questions. And at first, I'm not going to tell you what those questions are. We're just going to observe what happens in this muscle as I ask these questions. So I'm just going to point over here to this body part. This is the left shoulder. And I'm going to ask a question. Now, do you notice that that muscle resistance is different than it was a minute ago? Yeah, I do. It's squishy, isn't it? It's like Yeah, that, it's not as steady. That crispness isn't there. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to ask another question. And do you notice that it changed again? Kind of changed back to the way it was in the first mm -hmm. place. Well, here's the question that I asked Susie, and I asked it unconsciously. That is, I brought this question to mind with the intention of sharing that question, directing that question to Susie so that her, her body could give me a response. And the first time I asked the question, it was, is this the left shoulder? And I got a weak response, the way I'm getting now. And then I asked, is this the right shoulder? Is this the left shoulder? Is it the right shoulder? So this is a real simple example of how we can create a question, how we can direct it to the body, and how the body can understand that question. Not in terms of words, and that's the interesting thing about this. If you spoke Chinese and you didn't speak English, we would have gotten the same response. If you were deaf, we would have gotten the same response. If you spoke no language at all, we'd get the same response. And the fact is that 
Uh, even if I were testing an infant or I were testing an animal, I would get the same response. The difference would be that instead of muscle testing an infant or an animal directly, like I tested you, I would do surrogate testing, which we'll learn about later. I would either test myself as a stand-in for the infant or the animal, or I would use another person as a stand-in or surrogate to test for the infant or animal, directing that same question to the infant or animal and receiving a response through the surrogate or through myself as a surrogate. And how can that occur? Well, because again, when we come together with the intention of interacting, you and I and whoever might serve as a surrogate, we become connected around those issues that we're interested in communicating about. And we exchange information at an unconscious level, and that gives us this opportunity to use muscle response testing to bring to an observable level uh, the response that is already known at an unconscious level. Interesting, huh? Fascinating. In the test that we just did, I asked, is this the left shoulder? And I got a weak response. Is this the right shoulder? And I get a strong response. And the way I interpret that is the weak response is yes, the strong response is no. But the reason that that happens is that as we began, my presumption that I held in, in my mind as I began working with you is that your body would signal to me agreement or a positive response, a yes response, as a weak test and a negative response and no response is a strong test. But the only thing that has to happen to switch that is if I change my mind. And so if I change my mind now, and my intention is that the body show me by uh, strength, agreement, or a yes response, and weakness, uh, a no response, that's what we'll see. So if I ask, is this the left shoulder? I get a strong response. If I ask, is this the right shoulder? I get a weak response. And so it's very much the same thing that happens if we walk down the street some morning and we see some stranger and we say, good morning, they're going to say, good morning. If we say, buenos dias, they're going to say, buenos dias. Because they understand that the language that we're offering them is English or the language we offer them is Spanish and if they want to communicate with us then that's the best opportunity for them to do that is to engage in that language that we've offered and by the same token as I begin working with you or you begin working with anybody that you want to muscle test the language that you present to the subject is the language that they'll respond with so the only thing that can create confusion in this an inconsistent muscle test is if I didn't understand or you didn't understand that that was the case, that there was some magical determination of what the strong or weak test meant or that for each person there was a different uh, meaning for a strong or weak test. In fact, some people will try to test and, and they'll ask, uh, well, show me a strong test or, or excuse me, show me a yes response. And, oh, okay, that's what a yes response means. Uh, but the truth is that it, it isn't determined by the subject you're testing. Uh, and you'll always have consistent results if you simply understand that it's your decision uh, that the body respond uh, affirmatively with a strong response or affirmatively with a weak response as you prefer. And as long as you're consistent with that, you'll always get consistent results. One of the questions that comes up as we do muscle testing is, are we getting true responses? And what's the meaning of those responses? And the only thing that we can say about muscle response testing is that the body is telling us what it perceives to be true, right? What it perceives to be true about itself, what it perceives to be true about maybe external world challenges that it's facing that we're asking it about. And 
When I explain muscle response testing to people in healthcare, doctors or other professionals, sometimes they say, you know, that information is subjective. That's not objective information. So how can it be of value in making healthcare choices or making lifestyle choices? And the, the thing that I explain to them is, you know, that's absolutely right. It's subjective information. But the question that I always ask is, what other information does the body have available at any point in time to make choices about how it behaves and how it governs the body except what it perceives to be true about itself? There is no other information. And in fact, when you think about it, if you went to the Mayo Clinic and you said, I want you to give me every test on the menu, every blood test, every imaging test, magnetic resonance, a CT scan, I want you to x-ray everything and give me all the results, all those reams of paper, all those images, the fact is your body wouldn't know anything more about itself than it knew before you had those tests done, would it? So those tests are helpful for a medical doctor or somebody who's going to uh, make decisions about some particular medication or a surgery or some kind of treatment that will be applied. But when we talk about um, understanding the body's condition better and helping it to heal, uh, what we're really more interested in is how the body sees itself and how it sees the external challenges in the world around it and how it sees its options to respond to those things. So we have this idea then that the responses under the best of circumstances that we get from the body are the body's perception of its internal conditions and uh, the challenges it faces, the options it has to respond to those challenges. And as we discussed, that's good enough. When we talk about healing, we talk about something that arises from uh, an internal place and it arises based upon how the mind-body sees itself and its options to respond to the world. In terms of muscle testing, though, one question that we need to be aware of is not whether the questions or the responses to our questions are absolutely objectively true. In the context of the way we use muscle response testing, that doesn't matter. What we need to understand, though, is whether those responses are really accurate muscle response tests. And I'll give you a couple of possibilities. Let's say that you and I are are working together and we're going through a lot of muscle response testing and now it's been 45 minutes and I'm still testing your right arm and that deltoid muscle and we've been doing hundreds and hundreds of tests, not that that's going to happen terribly frequently, but imagine that happens. Is it possible that I might get yes responses, is this true, is this true, is this true, simply because your muscle is tired? Well, that's a possibility. Definitely, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we might consider is just as we're using muscle response testing, that it's possible that uh, the arm could be tired, the muscle could be tired or fatigued. Maybe the person that we're working with has a problem with their shoulder and they've just gotten to a point where it's fatigued or painful or uncomfortable and that's the reason we're getting weak tests. How would we know if that was true? Well, there's a way that I'll show you in just a moment that uh, is a really convenient way of testing the validity of the muscle response. The other possibility, have you ever had this situation, you're having a conversation with somebody, and usually when we have conversations with somebody, we're looking them in the eye, and there's some kind of, you know, feedback we get as we're talking to them, and uh, we see those responses, and, but I think we've all had that experience where we're talking with somebody and all of a sudden we realize that they're, they've got this hundred mile gaze. They're looking at something that's somewhere behind us mm -hmm. and looking over the shoulder and, and what do you do? You say, you say something like, well, you know what I mean? Or you, you kind of draw them back into the conversation, don't you? And so the point being that something can come to mind in the person that we're working with that will distract them so much that they're no longer interacting with us and it will be reflected in terms of the muscle test. So how do you know if that's happening as you're working with somebody? Well, here's how you know. If you ask any question, uh, and again, let's go back to a simple 
uh, unambiguous question, is this the left shoulder? And as I ask the question, what? I have already decided that a yes response is, is a weak response. And so I ask this question, is this the left shoulder? And I get a weak response. And my presumption is that's yes. Uh, it is, in fact, a firm affirmation that, that the body sees this as the left shoulder. Now, the question is, was this a valid muscle response, or is it because the patient uh, or the subject I'm working with was distracted and is no longer in this conversation with me, or that the muscle is weak or the muscle is uncomfortable, and, uh, and no matter what I ask, I'll get a weak response. Well, here's what I can do. I can ask, is this the left shoulder? And then I can immediately ask, is this not the left shoulder? It is the left shoulder. It is not the left shoulder. So here's the idea. This is called, guess what? The it is, it is not test. And the, the value of this is that no matter what question that we ask, and no matter what we've decided is the meaning of a strong or a weak response, all we have to do is change the uh, syntax of our question. And we change it from it is to it is not. And what we expect to see, if it's a valid muscle response, is immediately whatever was a weak test should go to a strong test. Whatever was a strong test should go to a weak test. And there's one thing that we can know if that happens, and that, that is whatever the response, the meaning of it was a valid muscle test. It was really a response from the mind-body to the question that we asked. And if we don't see that, the one thing that we can be sure of is that it meant something else. It meant nothing. It meant the arm was sore, the muscle was tired, or that the person we're working with was just distracted and they were no longer engaged in the conversation with us. So as we discussed, if we're muscle testing and we find that, um, let's say, we ask a question and uh, perhaps uh, I ask the question, is this the left shoulder? And I, let's say I get a yes response a weak response, and it means yes in my, in the language that I'm using in this muscle test. Um, now I can ask the question, it is, it is not, and I expect to see the contrast uh, that the it is, it is not test gives us an opportunity to observe. Now there's another possibility, and that is this, that when I ask the question, this is the left shoulder, I get an unexpected response. Um, in the language of muscle testing that I'm using, a yes response would be a weak test, but I ask the question, is this the left shoulder? And I get a strong response. And then I use the is, it is, it is not test, and I get a weak response. Excuse me, I get another strong response. So in other words, the, the response is the same. It could be the other way around. I could ask, is this the left shoulder? And I could check to see if it's a valid response. Is it not the left shoulder? And again, get a weak test. Now, in applied kinesiology, the traditional way of, of uh, teaching muscle response testing, this is called switching. And the idea uh, that's put forward in, in applied kinesiology is that there's an energetic blockage that's happened. And uh, so in applied kinesiology, the way you fix this is you stimulate certain points. There are acupuncture points here around the collarbone where it meets the sternum on each side and you rub those and you rub them and you rub them. And then there's some other spots back here around the inside corner of the shoulder blade and you rub those spots. Those are particular organ meridian points and you rub those spots, and by doing that, you release the blockage of the energy, and then you go back and you ask, is this the left shoulder? Is it not the left shoulder? And, hey, what do you know? It works. But then, after I studied with applied kinesiologists, and I then studied uh, something called NAET, an allergy elimination technique, 
that particular uh, teacher said, well, you know, when this happens, when you have this situation and you're getting a uh, non-responsive situation in the muscle testing, and you do the testing and you get a strong, strong test, or you get a weak, weak test, then what you need to do is realize that there's a polarity problem in the body. And so what they say is, what you need to do, there's a positive aspect electromagnetically to the pad of a finger, and there's a negative aspect to the nail of the finger. So what's happened in this subject and is blocking your, your proper muscle responses is that electromagnetically they have, they have polarized. So here's what you need to do. You need to go right here and hold a positive contact and then you need to flip it to a negative contact and you go back and forth like that, back and forth, and then you go back and you recheck and is this the left shoulder is it not the left shoulder? And what do you know? It works. And the thing that I realized is that, as often happens in the world of energetic uh, healing, there are a lot of things that people observe, and then they just, you know, the body likes, or the, the mind likes to make up stories. You know, it likes to make up explanations for things. Uh, everything's got to have a reason. And so what I realized is people just made up stories. And that, in fact, none of those stories were true. Every time this happens, that we get this strong, strong test in response to the it is, it is not test, or we get the weak, weak test, the only thing that's necessary is to invite the subject back into the conversation. And the way that we do that is simply by asking, is it okay to continue? It is, it is not. It is, it is not. And in fact, in, in practice, the simplest thing is just to bring this question to mind. Is it okay to continue without verbalizing? And at that point, we're back in contact. You've been, just like when you're having a conversation verbally with somebody and you realize they're staring over your shoulder and you say, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden they're looking at you again. They go, oh yeah, yeah, Susie, I know what you mean. And again, they're back in conversation. So. Whenever we're working, all we need to do is ask, is it okay to continue? And all these other explanations, the polarity business, the, the organ meridian points that are blocked, all these other explanations are simply unnecessary. And again, if we apply Occam's razor, we just throw away all those explanations that aren't necessary to explain what we observe. And we find that we have a nice, simple solution to a problem that everybody's going to run into sooner or later. As you're working with people and you're doing muscle testing, you're, you're going to find that this happens from time to time. The thing we want to think about in muscle response testing is how we perceive, how we feel on a physical level, the response of the muscle. And I've studied muscle response testing with many different people. Uh, hold your arm up for a moment. Uh, there was one person that I studied with who recommended that muscle response testing be done this way and that as we test, we would push all the way down like this. And you can imagine there are a couple of problems with that. One is that our subject is going to get tired very quickly. In fact, there are probably a lot of people, maybe elderly people, people who have had an injury to a, to a shoulder or other area that we might want to test, who simply aren't going to be able to do that kind of test at all. And uh, you aren't going to be able to get good responses. And again, the idea is let's get rid of anything that's unnecessary. And that level of physical force is unnecessary for the reason I just explained. But there's another reason, and that is if I'm muscle testing and I want to perceive a response in terms of a change in the muscle test from the body, if I use a lot of force and a great deal of distance as I do my testing, isn't it possible that I could push right past what it is that I'm trying to feel? That I could destroy the response by pushing right through it? And in fact, that's what happens often. And when a person is using muscle testing in a very uh, vigorous way, uh, uh, an unnecessarily forceful way, what happens is that the muscle test is not as sensitive, it's not as delicate, and you can miss things. So 
for two reasons. One, because it's just a lot more efficient and it's a lot less work and a lot less effort. So why not do it the easy way? We want to do muscle testing in a very gentle and a delicate way. And the other is because it is a more sensitive way of testing. So think of it this way. When we do muscle testing, the thing, the quality in the muscle that we want to observe is right on the surface. It's right on the surface. And if we use too much force and too much distance, what will happen is that we may push right through what it is we wanted to observe. So that brings me to the vegetable department. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed in grocery shopping is that some people are really scientific about the way that they choose their vegetables and they choose their fruit. And uh, they don't just start grabbing tomatoes or grabbing avocados and throw them in a bag, but they very carefully will assess to determine a piece of fruit that's properly ripe or overripe or not ripe enough. And uh, so in the context of muscle testing, uh, I want to use this idea to kind of reinforce the, the concept that what we're trying to perceive is really on the surface. So here I have two tomatoes. And when you look at these, can you tell which one is ripe and which one is overripe? Mm. Kind of hard by looking yeah. at them. They look pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes for a moment and just put your hands out and I'm going to give you a tomato in each hand and I want you to very gently feel those tomatoes, palpate those tomatoes, and I want you to tell me which one's the ripe one and which one's the one that's overripe. Overripe, and this one's... And you could one. do that. You could do that without... Let me see if I agree with you. Yeah, this one is nice and firm, but ripe enough for tonight's salad. And this one, I can tell without pushing my finger through it, and you could tell without making a dent in the mm -hmm. tomato, it's overripe, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And you could tell by within a millimeter or so of, of pressing, you could feel that resistance, couldn't you? Yeah. And that resistance is something that you'll feel as you're doing this muscle testing. We realize that as we come together to do this muscle response testing, we begin on this other than conscious, this subconscious level, sharing information. Uh, we want to think about this in terms of uh, what we observe in the muscle response test. Now, the thing that I had uh, pointed out to you is that in doing this test, is this the left shoulder, I want to see, uh, I want to feel for a very delicate response. I want to feel for something that's right on the surface and the strong response is right there, it's nice and crisp. And by the same token, if I ask, is this not the left shoulder, the weak response is just right there. And I'm, I'm just, I mean, it's, it's, it's ounces of pressure, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the arm just doesn't generate that crisp, strong response that we saw previously. The thing we have to understand is that your body knows to create that response because I have a picture of it in my mind as I begin working with you. Not a picture of whether the response is an affirmative response or a negative response. In fact, I want to be very careful as I do my muscle testing not to let any prejudice or expectation or uh, desire on my part influence an honest response from you. But what I mean by that is that I want to have an absolutely clear, palpable image in my mind of what it feels like to get that strong response or what it feels like to get that absolutely weak response. And if I have that picture in my mind as I begin working with you, then your mind-body perceives that and it knows what to reflect to me. It knows what to demonstrate to me. By the same token, if I'm not clear about that, if I don't have in mind this tremendous contrast between strong and weak, what I may find as I do the muscle testing and I ask, is this the left shoulder? Well, 
is this not the left shoulder? You know, there's not much contrast. I can't tell. Is that, is that a strong response? Is this the left shoulder? Maybe it was. Is this the right shoulder? Was that a weak response? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But if I'm crystal clear in my mind, and the, the image I have is that when I do the muscle test, it's almost like there was glue that suddenly set up in the joint, and it's just crisp as can be. And by the same token, if it's a weak response, it's like somebody just put Botox in the muscle and it can't respond. It's paralyzed. That's the image I have in mind. And if when you're doing your muscle testing, you're crystal clear on what the possibilities are, not what the response is, but what the possibilities of response are, a nice crisp response or a very mushy, mushy response, then you'll get responses that are high contrast and very easy and reliable for you to interpret. So Susie, now is the moment of truth. Now we get to uh, uh, see if you can uh, learn muscle response testing. There's a lot of information we gave you all at once, but I'm going to walk you through this step by step and I am positive you're not going to have any trouble at all. So here are a couple of things. One is you're going to decide what a what the meaning of a strong and a weak response is going into this. You'll have already decided. And uh, for consistency in our video here, uh, I'll just recommend that an affirmative test be a weak test. Okay. Agreed? So positive will be a weak response. Positive will be a weak response. Uh, if the answer to the question is yes, it's weak. If it's no, it's going to be a strong response. As you ask a question. The important thing is sequencing your challenge force that you offer against the muscle with your conceptualization of the question. We didn't talk about, we haven't talked about this yet, but uh, the important thing as you're doing the muscle testing that I'm going to have you do in just a moment is that when you ask the question that it doesn't look like this. Is this the left shoulder? Is this the left shoulder? In other words, I want to ask in my mind, is this the left shoulder and complete that question so that it's clear and I've had an opportunity to project that by intention to you before I introduce the challenge. Because you can imagine if I haven't completed the question and I, I jump the gun and I introduce that test force, then that might influence the validity of the response. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the trainings that I do in the NMT seminars, one of the things that I would observe after explaining carefully that here's how we do the test, we want to make it objective. So we use body parts in which there's no ambiguity. Your body knows what the left shoulder is. It knows what the heart is. What I'll see sometimes as I go around and I'm observing pairs of students that are working together is sometimes people will be asking questions are you a boy? Are you a girl? And is your name Susie? Is your name um, Midge? Is your name uh, Annie? And the thing that I always explain to people is always use body parts when you're doing this exercise. And the reason is because there is no ambiguity. And if you ask somebody if they're male or they're female, you know, sometimes people have gender identification issues. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have a gender identification issue on a Tuesday, but not on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Maybe they grew up thinking of themselves as Skipper or Butch or... Uh, the point is, we don't want to introduce a question that has an opportunity of being ambiguous because it may influence the answers in a way that's confusing to us in this exercise. And so I recommend uh, to you and also to the people that are learning uh, based on this, uh, this video to always use anatomical parts because they're objective, objectively uh, true and there won't be any ambiguity in the question and we're going to get a better and more reliable response. Now, as we begin, I want you to test me. And uh, we'll use this anterior deltoid muscle. Mm -hmm. And what I want you to do is decide on some particular body part to select. Mm -hmm. 
to indicate that by contact and then to mentally ask a question and at first you can do it out loud is this let's say the heart is this the left shoulder and see what response you get and then we'll have you do it silently and after we've done that we want to go through the exercise using the it is it is not test so you can be sure and you can see what it feels like when you get the uh, when you do the test of the validity of the response okay so I'm gonna like put my hands on your heart yeah, what okay. the heart or shoulder, whatever you want to test. And ready? Okay, yeah, and I think so. I'll hold my arm up here. Okay. And I'm going to do it here, right? Right. And you're doing the two pound chicken. Two pound right? chicken. Okay. We got the two pound chicken. Okay. And I'll say it out loud. Is this, yeah, to begin okay. with, let's do it that way. Is this your heart? Is this your liver? Okay. Now, I'm going to critique just a little bit. And the thing that we want to do as we're testing, as we apply a test, whatever the question is, is we want to load just a little bit of pressure with the fingertips. Mm -hmm. So I won't even have to tell the person I'm working with that I'm about to test them, just like happened just now. You could feel that couple of ounces of pressure that I preloaded into the muscle. And now you're ready to expect a test force which I smoothly apply. And the thing that we want to avoid is any kind of poking. We want to have, we want to make sure that the muscle is ready, that it's engaged and it's ready to be tested. And we know that because when we put just a little bit of force in as a preloading of the muscle, it contracts and we can feel that little bit of resistance. And then we ask our question and we immediately ramp up the test to that two or three pounds of force that we're going to apply to the muscle. Okay, let me try it again. See if I'm try that. Right. Okay. Like that? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's what we're looking for right there. Right, that's the test force and okay. you introduce the, uh, you get ready for that, to apply that test force by applying just a little bit of pressure so that you can feel that the muscle is now engaged. Okay. And then you ramp up to that, that higher level okay. of test force. Okay. Give it a try. Okay. Um, is this your right shoulder? Is this your left shoulder? Did I, was that right? Did that feel right? It felt, it felt good. Yeah. It okay. felt like a good test. Okay. So what else should I ask? <laughs> <laughs> well, what you might just something? go through, you know, uh, through the chest area. Is this the, uh, right lung? Is okay. this the heart? Is this the heart? Is this the stomach? And you can just pick okay. different body parts. Okay. doesn't matter what you pick as long as you're clear in your mind about what you're asking. Okay. Is this your liver? Is this your kneecap? Is this your left chest? Okay. Is this your stomach? Is this your forehead? How's that? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Were okay. you able to perceive the expected response from the muscle? I thought so, yeah. I mean... Yeah, it's something... You know, muscle response testing is uh, its an instrument. It's a tool. And uh, just like a, a musical instrument, uh, you go through uh, a training like this and you kind of learn where the keyboard is and you learn where the notes are, but uh, that's not mastery. Um, as you practice over a period of time, you develop the facility to be, to be really expressive and, and, and good with your instrument. And the same thing is true with muscle response testing. As we go through this initial testing, there's a certain amount of doubt that a person has. Was that, you know, it was pretty clear, but sometimes the response is, I'm not really exactly sure. As you do this work on a regular basis, maybe you spend a half an hour every day working with somebody to, to develop your skill, you get to the point that it's like speaking. 
you don't even think to speak. I, there was a point at, in time when you were a little kid where you would have to kind of think about how to express yourself. But you got to a point where it's just automatic. And the same thing is true with muscle response testing. As you go through a period of a few weeks and you spend a little bit of time every day, uh, it becomes automatic. So now let's go through the testing again. And this time what I want you to do is the same kind of testing. Uh, ask these questions, get a response, go through a couple of these, and then introduce the it is, it is not test. And what you expect to see, what you want to see very clearly, is that whatever the answer was that you got by asking a particular question, if you immediately ask the it is, it is not test, mm -hmm. it flips that result. It gives you the opposite result. Mm -hmm. And that's what lets you know that in fact what you, what you were getting was a valid muscle response test. Mm -hmm. So here's what I'll have you do is the same test we did before, we'll ask, is this the heart? And now immediately we'll ask the question, is this not the heart? It is the heart, it isn't the heart, it is, it isn't. And that's just as clear as can be, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It reverses every time I, I change my intention as far as what my question is. It is, it isn't. And so that's what I want you to do is see if you can feel that contrast as you first select whatever you par part you want to select and ask, is this in fact that part? And then you reverse that question, is it not? And hmm. what we want to see is that there's a reversal of the response. A strong goes to weak, weak goes to strong. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think so. Okay. So, is this the heart? Is this not the heart? Interesting. That's a big difference there, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is this your left shoulder? Is this not your left shoulder? Huh. Okay. Um, keep going. Just sure, sure. You can do a few more of these, but it looks like you're getting the response okay. that it's expected. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it feels pretty clear to you, right? Mm -hmm. The contrast. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is this your stomach? Is this not your stomach? Hmm. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's interesting. Great. So, you're a natural. Yay! <laughs> now, we want to make the test just a little different. Uh, it's obvious if we're doing the test and we ask something out loud, you can hear what I'm saying, is this the left shoulder? Um, consciously or subconsciously, you might want to try to cooperate so that I do well in the testing. And so, we want to take that variable out. And when I ask you to do the test now, I'll demonstrate it uh, without doing, without saying anything, only conceptualizing. And of course, you're the one who will know if the answer was appropriate or not appropriate. And as I'm doing it now, I too will know if it's appropriate or not appropriate. So initially I'll ask, and what I asked, is this the right shoulder, I got a yes. Is this the left shoulder? I got a no. And then I asked twice again, is this the right shoulder? Is this the right shoulder? And even though Susie didn't hear what I was saying, her body heard on a subconscious level what I intended as I directed that question. And so I'll ask you to do the same thing with me. I won't be able to hear. And so on a conscious level, I can't influence the test. Okay. And uh, this is something that, uh, is really important because as you begin muscle testing, you may not be very confident about this idea that, boy, can I just have a thought in my mind? Can I direct a question to somebody and they actually know what it means? But you know, if I do this test with you and I ask the questions the way I just did in a silent way and the muscle response changes, what other explanation is there? Your body perceived what I was thinking and that has a really positive effect on my confidence, doesn't it, in terms of doing this kind of uh, exchange, whether we're using it in the course of uh, neuromodulation technique or whether you're using it in some other kind of uh, uh, testing or evaluation that you want to do.
So let's have you do that with me and okay. see what kind of response you get. Okay, and I'm not going to say it out loud, right? I'm not going to say it out loud. Okay. Good. Huh. Wow. So you got expected responses. Yeah. Uh huh. It's great. One of the things that I'll mention <clears throat> as kind of a fine point is to really emphasize this idea that what we're trying to pick up is right on the surface and uh, even though in the testing that I've been showing on camera I push enough that you can kind of see uh, on, on camera what the response is that what you want to feel for is a strong test right on the surface that you're, you're actually not even going to move the uh, joint or the uh, uh, appendage that you're testing. You're not even going to physically move it. If the crispness is there, then it's there. And if the weakness is there, then that, that flexibility, that uh, softness is there right on the surface and, and you really won't push as far as maybe I've been demonstrating on mm -hmm. camera. And the result of that will be that you get a much more sensitive, uh, strong response and a much more sensitive, weak response. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Susie, as we were doing our muscle response testing, we were using these big muscles in the shoulder and uh, they're handy for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, on a video like this, it's pretty easy to see uh, the responses uh, visually for the, for the viewer. But in practice, um, I may sometimes use this big muscle, but uh, actually it's more convenient uh, for a couple of reasons that I'll describe in a minute to use other muscles. And depending on situations, uh, we may choose to select different muscles, just different muscle joint combinations uh, to use for our muscle testing uh, because it just works better for us. Maybe it's more convenient for us. So what I want to show you is the muscle testing that we use uh, typically in the uh, practice of NMT. And for those of you that will be taking the NMT seminar, uh, this is uh, the muscle testing that uh, we'll be recommending and uh, uh, teaching. Uh, for application of, of NMT with uh, clients and uh, subjects. Uh, in the course of doing NMT, we use what are called therapeutic dialogues. And each of these therapeutic dialogues uh, revolves around some particular area of physiology. So uh, we might use uh, what's called the sensory motor uh, pathway. And we might use that, let's say, if you had a complaint of stiffness in the neck or maybe you had a TMJ problem, jaw tension or something like that, headaches. And the, the way we would use that is by going through the specific questions that would draw your mind-body to look at the way it was working in terms of setting tensions in the muscles and the way it was interpreting sensation from the different tissues of the body in the way it was deciding on motor signals to send to create uh, tension um, and uh, we would go through these various questions in order to raise mind-body awareness and then we would uh, offer various corrective statements to invite the mind-body uh, to make certain changes in the way it works on a sensory motor level and the response that we usually see is immediately pain levels go down uh, tension patterns disappear, uh, blockages in the vertebra, uh, let's say in a, the example I gave of the neck problem, disappear and range of motion comes back and people find that they're much more comfortable immediately. The, the point is that is as we do this NMT process, we make a lot of tests, we make a lot of evaluations, and if we were always using 
this big muscle in the shoulder, it might be kind of fatiguing or tiring. It. In other words, we'd just be working harder than we need to. So we're going to use a different muscle. And this muscle is right here. It's a muscle that flexes the elbow in this position. And the name of it is the brachioradialis muscle. Not that you need to remember that. But it's a muscle that uh, I typically find uh, I can work with somebody for 20, 30 minutes or more in doing all of the various testing that we do in the context of NMT, and it, it vir virtually never gets tired. So this is uh, what I'm going to ask you to do, is just place your elbow in this position so that I can do that testing with you. Okay. And typically we have the palm pointed down. I usually ask the subject to make a light fist like this. and. Uh, I'll usually apply fingertip pressure at the end of the hand. Uh, for some people, their wrist is kind of unstable or weak, and if that's the case, I'll just apply fingertip pressure right here. But again, uh, using the uh, static muscle test exercise that we uh, have been using, and then having a clear picture in my mind of the crisp resistance in this muscle, is this the chin, and that resistance is right there, and then is this the forehead, and I just picture that it's like somebody put Botox in the uh, brachioradialis muscle, is this the forehead, and with only uh, ounces of pressure uh, we get that weak response. Is this the chin, is this the forehead, and I can use the it is, it is not test, is this the forehead, and we get the weak test, is this not the forehead? It is the forehead. So everything is the same uh, in terms of uh, how we envision the muscle test and how we do the muscle test. It's just that uh, by selecting this muscle, we have uh, a muscle joint combination here at the elbow that is really easy to use and we can do a lot of testing. So if you were using the uh, test maybe to evaluate a number of different foods or something like this to ask uh, the body if it perceived particular foods to be a, uh, uh, an allergen, um, uh, no matter how many of those tests you might do, uh, you'd find that this was just a, a really easy way to do it, that the arm doesn't get fatigued, and that you're able to do these tests over and over again uh, without the, the uh, person you're working with becoming uncomfortable. So we've looked at two types of muscle response testing, the one using the deltoid muscle in the shoulder, and then the one that we prefer for convenience uh, that uses this brachioradialis muscle. And uh, on a person-to-person -person test uh, basis, rather, as we're working with somebody, those are pretty good tests to use. There are other kinds of applications of muscle response testing that it might be convenient if we had different tools. So one of those is either self-testing or surrogate testing because uh, muscle testing is not only something that we want to use for other people but we might want to direct some of these questions internally to find out how our own body responds toward some particular food or some particular nutrient or uh, some particular exposure and to see if it has a positive or a negative effect. So when we're doing testing of ourselves, we need to test in a little different way. And the first test that I want to show you is one in which we use the extensor muscles of the hand uh, and uh, we test them using the other hand. So in this case, we just put the thumb right here where the fingers join the palm of the hand and we apply a test force with uh, these fingers. and. So again, we load a little bit of resistance. We can feel that those extensor muscles are, uh, are, are locked up. And then we produce some particular question. If I uh, direct my attention and my intention, let's say, to my right arm, and I uh, think about my right elbow, and I ask, is this my right elbow? The response is, a weak test, an affirmative test. If I ask, is this my left elbow? Is this my left knee? I get a strong test, a negative test. Is it my right elbow? So 
In this case, we use the extensor muscles because of just the physiology of extensor muscles. They'll resist fairly well, and then when they go weak, they kind of go weak all of a sudden. And that's different, let's say, than the flexor muscles that are strong, strong, strong all the way. Uh, the, the extensor muscles kind of fail catastrophically, and because they do, they give us a high contrast test. So it's easy for us to feel the difference between a yes and a no response. So you might try that and just see how that feels to you as you test yourself, maybe directing your attention to a knee, an elbow, whatever you like, and asking the questions uh, in the way that we did our, our static MRT okay. test. And I can just think of the body part like, okay, I'm you thinking can just, of my right knee. That's right. right okay. Okay. Um, is this my right knee? Is this my left knee? Is this my left elbow? Is this my forehead? Is this my stomach? Is this my kneecap? Huh. Are you I, able I to feel, feel I, the difference? I do. I, just very subtly, yeah. barely. Let, let me try this, and I'll do the testing uh, in, in the way you would. Hold your hand straight, and I'm just testing the resistance. I feel pretty clear resistance. So uh -huh. I'll ask the question, is this the left shoulder? Is it the right shoulder? Left shoulder, right shoulder. Is it the left shoulder, the right shoulder, the left shoulder, the right shoulder? Is this the right knee? Is it the left knee, the right knee, the left knee, the right, the left? Can you feel that difference? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, a little more clearly than when you did it? Yeah. And mm -hmm. part of that is not just the mechanics of how I'm doing this, but there is a skill that comes with the experience of doing it, of projecting our questions to the subject that we're working with. And again, it's just something that comes automatically by repetition. Mm -hmm. Again, it's like the riding the bicycle. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, as you do some of this testing, uh, realize that there are a couple things going on at once. Not only the mechanics of how you place your hand, how you apply the force, but what you're doing in terms of how you project, how you model and how you project uh, the intention of your question to the, the, to the source that you're you're uh, projecting it to either another person or inwardly to your own uh, subconscious. Okay, let's talk about a couple of other uh, tests. And uh, one of the tests is uh, called the O-ring test. It's uh, a test that was developed by a Japanese medical doctor named uh, Omura. And uh, so it's often referred to as the Omura O-ring test. And uh, the idea here is that we create a circle with one hand, with the thumb and the index finger, and we apply a certain level of resistance. Uh, obviously, we could use so much resistance that we couldn't break through. Uh, we could also make the resistance so little that uh, we would never feel the resistance as we try to break through. But in this test, the idea is to find just the right level of resistance similar to the idea of using the two pound chicken when we did that here. And uh, a level of resistance that as we attempt with the finger of the other hand to break through the circle, we're kept from doing that. And that's the strong response. But when the answer to the question is affirmative, let's say, and we want to, we expect a weak response that uh, the change in resistance in the in the o-ring lets us break through so we might i might direct attention then to susie and and my attention to the uh, right knee and ask is this the left elbow is it the right elbow is it the right knee and what I feel is that when I ask, is it the left elbow, there's a firm resistance there. 
if I ask, is it the left knee, there's a firm resistance. And with the same level of effort here, holding the ring, if I ask, is it the right knee, the, th the finger breaks through more easily. Okay, again, that's a test that just a person has to work with a little bit to get the feel of it. There's a variation on this, and that is to make this ring and to use the thumb and index finger of the other hand to try to spread the ring. And we would ask a, a question and test and see if we get a strong response or we get a weak response, in which case we can feel that the ring opens up more easily. And so that difference, the strong versus the weak test, uh, we would use as a yes or no response. There's another type of a test, and this is actually my favorite test because uh, of a couple of reasons. One is that it's a one-handed test. It's the only, well, it's not the only one-handed test, but it's, it's my favorite one-handed test. <laughs> and in this test, we use the index finger extensors, and we hold the index finger straight, and that's the test E. That's the muscle that's being tested. And we use the middle finger, the flexors of the middle finger, and that's the tester. So at some point there's a kind of a distinction that we're making in our minds and the part of our minds that control our muscles. We're trying to operate this middle finger tester independently from the index finger, and it takes a little while to get the feel of that. But uh, again, uh, we apply our, we, we create our question that we're asking, and uh, we direct our intention. In this case, is this the left shoulder? And I get a response, a weakness that gives me a yes. Is this the right shoulder? And I get a resistance that tells me that the answer is a no. So this is a test that uh, is one that may take a little work to get the feel of. And for me, it was one in which uh, I had to do some kind of special little procedures to get myself to be able to feel that because I saw this test done years and years ago and I would try to do it and it just, I couldn't feel it. So here's what I did is I took a test that I was absolutely confident in let's say this test. And when I would have uh, subjects in my office that I was testing, I would uh, go through whatever it was that I was evaluating, creating, uh, posing the different questions that uh, I would be asking the body, and I would get some answer to a particular question, and it would be very clear to me because of my familiarity with this muscle test. So what I would do at that point is pose the same question to that subject, only now I would use this muscle test. And what I would do at that point is try to internally feel what is it that I need to do and how I'm operating my hand and feeling the resistance of these muscles that will allow me to feel that uh, same response that I got from the shoulder muscle test. And eventually, within a minute or so, I would, ah, now I get the same response. And so again, I would go back and I would be going through my evaluation with the subject and I would be asking other questions and I would be getting determinations. And again, I would see what I needed to do internally to get the same response here. And it became easier and easier. So after a couple of days, what I found is that every time I did a familiar test and then I would try to confirm it with this new test that it was just right there. So at that point, what I did is I would continue to work only now. My first test would be this test. I'd get a response, and then I would confirm it with the more familiar test. So by doing that, within a period of just two or three days, I, I got to the point where I had absolute confidence in this muscle test, uh, which I had previously not been able to do. So as just kind of a device or a mechanism, if you have a particular muscle test that just works really well for you, it's very familiar and it's easy for you to do and you're confident in it, and you have another muscle test that you want to learn, you can kind of tr transition between the two in, in that way. As we've learned muscle response testing today, 
we've learned it as a tool and, and the real question is uh, how this is going to be applied because it, it is only a tool, it's not a, it's not a procedure that corrects or fix anything in and of itself, but it's a tool that we apply for different purposes and as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of my reasons for wanting to uh, teach this uh, web seminar is uh, so more people could become familiar with muscle response testing and hopefully become interested in uh, using muscle response testing in the context of our NMT seminars uh, in order to learn how to uh, heal themselves, their friends, their family, uh, and uh, uh, people they may work with in their healthcare practice. So I want to discuss just uh, briefly uh, something uh, with regard to uh, what we call quantification. Uh, as what we've seen in terms of this, what we call static muscle response testing, is that uh, we're basically able to pose a question and then we're able to get an affirmative or negative answer, yes, no answer, in response to that question. And uh, that's important information. But one of the things that uh, adds to the value of muscle response testing is to be able to quantify, to not only find out uh, is this so, is this not so, but to what degree is this so, and to what degree is this not so. Because we live in a world that uh, is not uh, colored in blacks and whites, but mostly in a whole lot of shades of gray, and so being able to evaluate, uh, to uh, uh, quantify a particular answer is, uh, is often helpful. And uh, briefly then, uh, in uh, our work in neuromodulation technique, uh, there are basically three uh, kinds of quantification that we do. And one of those uh, is a simple uh, numeration. So we might have, let's say, uh, an example of how you might use this uh, just in everyday application of muscle response testing would be in regard to, let's say, asking about how many foods in a particular meal, how many items in a particular meal uh, somebody might uh, be having an allergic response to. In which case, we simply would apply uh, uh, a counting kind of a, a metric. In other words, let's say that we're working with somebody and uh, they don't feel so good after eating a particular meal. And um, we'll assume that's the case for you and we'll just kind of mock up this example. So Susie's had a lunch and um, we want to test to see how many of the foods that she was exposed to that uh, her body is, uh, is finding uh, allergenic or offensive. And so we can simply ask, uh, is there one, uh, two, three, four? So I get a yes at three, a no at four. A yes at three, a no at four. Well, what does that mean? Uh, what it means is this. Uh, as I ask the question, a yes answer for me means that the body agrees that the number that I've specified, one, two, three, it's at least the number of foods that are offensive, that are allergenic for her, is at least one, two, three. And when I get to four, is it at least four? And the answer is no. So we have to, I have to be clear in my mind as, as I ask the question what I mean by the number I'm specifying. And uh, generally, as I propose a particular number for whatever it is I'm testing for, the, answer, the, the question is, is it at least this? Is it at least this? And so if I get a yes answer, it means just that. It's at least this. When I go on to the next number in whatever series it is that I'm testing, uh, it may be a no indicating that the last yes response is my answer. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other scale that we might use is a percentage scale maybe a 0 to 100% scale, or a plus or minus 100% scale. And again, it would depend on what it is that we were evaluating. 
So let's say, let's say that you had a sinus infection and you'd had it for a week and you're doing better, but it's not completely gone. And you'd like to know what percentage of these infectious agents that are in the sinuses has the immune system gotten rid of? So we could ask the question, uh, with regard to the sinus infection, is the percentage to which the infection has been eliminated 100%, 90, 80, 70, 70%? And again, how am I applying the, the scale? Um, is it this much, 100%, and I get a no, 90%, 80%, 70%, and I get a yes. So I just have to be clear as I'm applying whatever the scale is uh, in how I mean that it be applied. What is the question I'm asking? And in the percent scale, uh, is it uh, at least this? Is it at least this? Is it at least this? And if I get a no, 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 it's not that much. In the case that I just mentioned, when I get to 70%, I get a yes, and what that means is it's somewhere between 70% and the question that I asked previously that I got a no, which is 80%, so it's somewhere between 70 and 80%. So there are a number of ways in, in which you can imagine that you might want to apply a percent scale or a plus minus percent scale. <clears throat> the method of quantification that we use most often in NMT, and it's one that, uh, that I really like, I think it offers us a lot of possibilities, is what we call the log 1000 scale. And here's the idea, is that uh, whatever it is that we want to uh, get a, a numeration for or a quantification for, whatever it is that we can imagine, uh, we use a scale in which we begin at zero, and zero means zero, but a thousand on our scale is as high as the scale goes. And a thousand means infinity, or as close as we can imagine. I don't think anybody has a clear idea what infinity actually means, but this is the way we describe it. Zero is zero, a thousand is the greatest that we could imagine, the biggest that we can imagine, the most that we can imagine. And it's a logarithmic scale, so it's kind of a, a curve like this. And so we imagine that each number, as we successively go one after another after another, is 10 times the previous. So it gives us an opportunity to visualize a scale in which the higher we go, the bigger the increment is between the next number and the next number and the next number, the difference between 900 and 990 on our scale is much, much bigger than the difference between 100 and 110 on our scale. So that's the idea of it. And uh, we don't have to have a perfect understanding of that. Uh, only this, this uh, picture that the higher we go, the, the greater the meaning of each of these divisions is. So we can apply this in a number of ways and uh, I'm going to demonstrate in a minute how we do that with regard to evaluating the intensity of an allergen, uh, the perceived intensity of an allergen to the body and we'll do that with a couple of different foods. Now you don't actually have any allergies to foods. Not that I know of. Not that you know of, um, but you know there's a a, a thought that uh, many people in healthcare have that virtually anything is an allergen to one degree or another. Um, and when you think about it, you know, uh, people who have allergies, have, there's an enormous scale uh, between a person who just with the tiniest exposure to something has a terrible anaphylactic allergy and the throat closes and the face swells up to somebody who maybe has no reaction at all to something like uh, bread, but you know if they eat five or six slices of bread, they notice that you know, they don't feel quite as good. Maybe they're not as alert, they're a little sleepy, the tummy doesn't feel as good. So 
The idea here is that even for somebody like you that doesn't have overt allergies, we could evaluate foods to see what the relative level of allergenicity is. And even if it's relatively low, we're going to see that the body may perceive to some degree that it, uh, it uh, sees an allergic response towards some of these things. So we'll, we'll do that in just a minute. So we, we have a variety of foods here. We're going to test uh, Susie. As a practical matter, in neuromodulation technique, we, we don't even usually uh, use uh, actual uh, substances except as a test challenge occasionally. Uh, most of our testing is done semantically, conceptually, uh, through lists of various uh, allergens. Uh, but just uh, to make this a more hands-on kind of a test and the sort of thing that uh, those of you that uh, haven't had uh, uh, NMT training yet uh, might do, in uh, evaluating these kinds of things for yourselves or your friends or your family, uh, we'll use these actual substances. And uh, what we're going to do is pose the question to Susie's body, to what degree do you see these foods as, uh, as allergenic? And again, uh, we use a scale that goes from zero to a thousand, this kind of exponential scale, and what, was the, what does a thousand mean? Well, uh, imagine absolutely the worst allergic response you can think of. Uh, the body uh, goes into a self-destructive mode of anaphylaxis and inflammation. The throat closes, the blood vessels expand. Uh, horrible, horrible, horrible thing. That's a thousand. And zero is absolutely no allergic response at all. No matter how much of something you would be exposed to, no response at all. And everything else is somewhere between one and a thousand. So that's our understanding as we apply this, uh, this scale. Now, let's have you just uh, hold on to this and uh, I'll go ahead and muscle test you and our, my question, the question in my mind, is uh, to what degree does the body see this as an allergen? Our scale goes from zero to a thousand, so I'll start in the middle. Is it at least 500? Is it not? Is it 400, 300, 200, 100, 150, 140? 140. So we could narrow that down even more, although it's not usually worth the effort, 145, 43. And so the answer to the question, uh, how much, uh, to what degree is a tomato seen as an allergen, 143 on a scale that goes to 1,000. Not very much. Maybe it means you'd have some troubles if you ate nothing but tomatoes every day, all day, but uh, not much of a problem. So we have an avocado. Let's have you hold on to that, Susie. And again, the question, to what degree does the body see the avocado as an allergen? And uh, is it at least 500, 400, 300, 200, 100, 90, 80, 70, 70? Well, it's a different answer. It's a different answer. And it looks like your body likes uh, avocados. Uh, let's take a look at egg. And again, we'll have you resist, and the question, to what degree does the body see egg as an allergen? Is it at least 500, 400, 300, 200, 100, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 50? You and eggs get along very well. Uh, these are pumpkin seeds, raw pumpkin seeds, and so we'll have you hold on to that. And again, the question is, uh, to what degree does the body see pumpkin seed as an allergen? And is it log 500, 400, 300, 50, 60, 360? Hmm. It's not a terribly high number, but it's fairly high. I'd certainly compared to avocado or tomato, it's much higher. Uh, or egg, much higher. Not enough necessarily that you'd be aware of it, but you know, if you ate uh, pumpkin seeds every day, you might notice something. Maybe that the elimination, the GI system wasn't working quite the way it usually does, or you might notice that you don't feel quite as energetic. Something subtle 
You know, if the number were 850, it would be really obvious. At 350, 360, uh, not so obvious. Okay, and this is red miso. You ever eat miso? Mm -mm. Miso is uh, fermented soybeans, use it in soups and things in Japanese cooking. Huh. So it'll be interesting to see since you've never been exposed to it. But uh, the question again, with regard to the red miso, um, the degree to which the body sees it as an allergen is log 500, 50, 60, log 560. So it's a fermented product, and uh, sometimes fermented, fermented products are um, aggravating to people. So that's a significant number, and uh, we might see if that was uh, uh, something that you had maybe in a bowl of miso soup that you might have a little itchiness in the throat, or um, you might find uh, that you notice some kind of symptom with that. Mm. So this is the way that we would apply our scale, this is the way we would do our testing, and uh, of course when we have the, uh, all the tools of neuromodulation technique, we actually have a way of immediately uh, changing the body response to, to these things. So those of you that are watching, and uh, Susie, you now uh, have a tool that you can use to uh, investigate things in yourself, uh, in your children, or your friends, or your family. If you're a healthcare practitioner, you can apply the uh, muscle response testing to get uh, responses from the people that you work in your practice and you can apply this in a variety of different ways. You can be asking questions about how the body perceives some particular food or some environmental exposure, whether it sees something as a toxin, whether it sees something as an allergen, and you can use that to help in a variety of ways. Avoiding particular exposures at this point uh, would be probably the way that you would use the information that you'd get from muscle response testing. In neuromodulation technique, we use this uh, testing uh, to guide us through the neuromodulation technique protocol, and the result of that is to actually change the way the body responds to things that it previously uh, perceived as allergens, uh, to, to cause it to uh, no longer produce allergy responses, uh, to cause it to optimize its uh, methods of uh, detoxification, uh, to optimize the way the sensory motor system governs uh, tension and pain perception in the body. And uh, so uh, we'd like you to consider uh, visiting us at the NMT website, www.nmt.md, and learn a little bit more about neuromodulation technique, take a look at our training schedule, for live NMT seminars that are open to uh, the public, open to healthcare practitioners, and also consider uh, that uh, we have uh, home DVD trainings in all of our seminars that are available for you if you're unable to get to any of our live seminars and would like to learn NMT on your own. So thanks for joining us, and uh, we hope that uh, you found the seminar helpful and uh, we'll enjoy using uh, muscle response testing uh, to uh, make better choices, lifestyle choices, uh, and uh, better understand uh, the way the mind-body works. Thanks for joining us.